Hello and welcome to the Heretics of Dune summary. This is Dune book number five, the second to last in the series. Now, if you just want to get to the story, you can skip ahead. I've put timestamps down in the description. The basic summary of the story is that we're 1,500 years after Leto II's death, and we have all these factions competing for power of the Empire. We have the Bene Gesserit, who kind of want to reclaim some of the power that they lost under the tyrant's rule. The Tilaxu, who after millennia feel that this is finally a chance to ascend. And we also have some newcomers, the Honored Matres. They're described as a matriarchal cult, similar to the Reverend Mothers, but their powers lie more in their sexual prowess, I guess. And so what results is basically a web of alliances and betrayals between all these players. And the Bene Gesserit are definitely center stage in the story. Two other very important characters are Shayana, a descendant of Siona Atreides. She lives on Rakis, previously known as Arrakis, and she can control the worms. And so obviously the Bene Gesserit want to bring her into the fold. We also have Duncan Idaho, the Gola. No pun intended, but the storyline refuses to die. Anyway, it's the Bene Gesserit who have the Telaxu create more Duncan Idaho Golas because the Bene Gesserit feel that this Gola is instrumental in advancing their cause. That's the story in a nutshell. Now, God Emperor of Dune ended up being one of my favorites, so I don't mind a lengthy read, but I feel like for what this story was, I didn't need 660 pages and that was in large part why I really struggled with this. I ended up having to binge it in four days because I realized that if I put it down, I wouldn't want to pick it up again. And so it wasn't the most pleasant reading experience. I gotta say, I still did enjoy the story and I'm really looking forward to Chapter House. Anyway, that's about enough for me. Onto the video. In Heretics of Dune, we find ourselves 1,500 years after Leto II's death on the planet Gamu once ruled by the Harkonnens and previously known as Gieri Prime, until Gurney Halleck changed its name to Gamu. The Reverend Mothers are overseeing the development of the 12th Duncan Idaho Gola. The Reverend Mother Shwangu is telling another Reverend Mother Lucilla that they've gone through 12 of these Golas now, and she's complaining not only about the cost of the Golas, but the fact that the Golas are dangerous to the sisters. Reverend Mother Shwangu is against the Gola project overseen by the Bene Gesserit, which has them training young Duncan Idaho Golas, which are sold to them by the Tilaxu. And as they're talking about this, they are watching a young Duncan, about 12 years old, busy with his training. Reverend Mother Shwengu believes that it was the Tilaxu themselves who had killed most of the previous 11 Golas, somehow having gotten through the Reverend Mother's defenses at the keep, and there has already been an assassination attempt on the 12th Gola. Lucilla wonders if there's any heresy among the Reverend Mothers. This comes to mind when she thinks of Reverend Mother Shuangu, who isn't really trusted with the safety of the Golas. It would shatter the Bene Gesserit if there were to be a revolt against the Mother Superior Taraza. She'd issued her command, and the sisters were committed to obey. The Gola project definitely touched an old nerve among the sisters. The possibility, even remote, that they might arouse another Kwisatz Haderach sent shudders of angry fear through the ranks. To meddle with the worm-bound remnants of the tyrant, that was dangerous in the extreme. This is why Shwangu is against the Gola project. Lucilla doesn't know what the entire design for the Duncan Idaho Golas is, because for her task as an imprinter, more on that later, she doesn't need to be privy to that. Reverend Mother Shwangu does tell her that there is a female child, Shayana Brew, on Arrakis, now called Rakis, who can control giant worms, and she asks Lucilla if their gola might be able to influence the girl, but Lucilla doesn't want to speculate. As imprinter of the gola, Lucilla's task is to teach him love in all forms. Because he's still a child, she should awaken his childish responses to maternal affections, so basically acts like a loving mother. As Lucilla watches the child in the courtyard, she begins to have a new appreciation for what the tyrant god emperor had actually achieved. Later, the second had employed this Gola type through uncounted lifetimes, some 3,500 years of them, one after another. He had been the biggest juggernaut in human history, rolling over everything. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage had left nothing unmarked, not even the Bene Gesserit. Later, the second had called it the Golden Path. And this Duncan Idaho type Gola below her now had figured prominently in that awesome passage. The tyrant has surpassed the Bene Gesserit best, and in 1,500 years since the tyrant's death, 
the sisterhood remained powerless to unlock the central knot of that fearsome accomplishment. We then meet the Reverend Mother Superior Taraza. She's looking at a display of one of the sisters, Odrade, who had borne 19 children for the Bene Gesserit, all with different fathers. Odrade was in the Atreides line, a descendant of Siona. Both Taraza as Mother Superior giving commands and Odrade, a loyal sister who carries them out, are the two main players advancing the Bene Gesserit its mission for power in Heretics of Dune. We're introduced then to a young Duncan Idaho who is thinking about how much he hates Reverend Mother Shuangu. He hated her from the age of nine, four years now. She did not know of his hate, he thought. She had forgotten all about the incident where his hate had been ignited. Barely nine and he had managed to slip through the inner guards out into the tunnel that led to one of the pillboxes. He peered out through the pillbox's weapon slits before getting caught and hustled back into the core of the keep. This escapade occasioned a stern lecture from Shuangu, who told him that the guards will be severely punished for this. Duncan liked some of the guards and realized that his prank had hurt some of his friends. He learned then from his chief instructor, Talemane, that history was seldom good to those who were punished. Punishments were also emotionally painful. Emotion evoked by punishment is always that emotion which we judge to be the penitent's greatest weakness, and thus we strengthen the punished. After their punishments, the guards never spoke of their ordeal, but they also never played with Duncan again. Duncan, at this time, is being prepared to go and live on Rakus, that mysterious planet and its miserable church of Shai Hulut, the divided god. Worms. The god emperor had become one of those worms. The idea filled Duncan with awe, and the very idea of worms fascinated him. Their size, a big one would stretch from one end of the keep to the other. Men had ridden the pre-tyrant worms, but the Rakian priesthood forbade this now. Duncan learns of Siona and Duncan Idaho, who were both invisible to prophets and prescience. Of course, when he asks his instructors why he has the same name as the Duncan Idaho as in the history book, they don't reveal anything. One day in the library at 10 years old then, he learns the truth about himself. Siona, accounts told him, was a true bred Atreides and Duncan Idaho was a Gola. Gola? He probed the library for elaborations on this peculiar word, Gola. The library had produced for him no more than bare-boned accounts, Golas. Humans grown from a cadaver's cells in Telaxu axletal tanks. Axletal tanks, a Telaxu device for reproducing a living human being from cells of a cadaver. Duncan learned to read the silences, the blank places in what the people of the keep revealed to him. Revelation swept over him. He knew. Only ten and he knew. I'm a Gola. Young Duncan continues to ask questions. Tell me about the Bene Tleilax he demanded of the library. They are a people self-divided into face dancers and masters. Face dancers are mules, sterile and submissive to the masters. Why did they do this to me? Why am I so important to Shuangu and the others? He felt that they had wronged him, even Miles taken patron. Why was it right to take the cells of a human and produce a gola? He asked the next question with great hesitation. Can a gola ever remember who he was? It can be done. How? The psychological identity of the gola to original presets certain responses which can be ignited by trauma. Duncan then becomes determined to recapture his memory so that he can remember his parents, friends, and his enemies. One of Duncan's trainers and observers there to foresee his safety is a Mentat Bashar, Miles Tegg. He's a famous military leader for the Bene Gesserit and he is weapons master to the Gola child. Miles Tegg had not wanted the Gamu assignment. It was an unwanted intrusion into Tegg's well-ordered retirement, but he had lived all that life as a military Mentat under the will of the Bene Gesserit and could not compute an act of disobedience. The Bene Gesserit's moral purpose agreed completely with Teg's principles. That those principles were Bene Gesserit conditioned in him did not enter into the question. Rational thought, especially Mentat rational thought, could make no other judgment. He had lived a long life with many high points and he was retired with honor. Teg knew he was old, slow, and with all the defects of age waiting just at the edge of his awareness. But the call to duty had come from Teraza personally. The powerful senior of all singled him out. Not just a reverend mother, but the reverend mother superior. 
she'd come to his home when Duncan was still six years old and, and asked Teg to oversee Duncan's military training. Teg, by the way, does have Atreides genes and a very strong resemblance to the Atreides Duke, the first Leto. Teraza tells him that a female child with the ability to control worms has been discovered on Rakis and they will have use for the Gola there. She also warns him not to trust Shuangu. The Tilak city of Bandalong belonged to the most powerful of the Talaxu known as Waf and he's savoring a long-awaited moment. The Talaxu have been waiting millennia for their ascendancy and have long since been fostering myths about their so-called weaknesses that they had fooled everyone, even the Bene Gesserit. Waf presents something called the Atreides Manifesto, words written on a sheaf of Redillian crystal authored by a true Atreides, and he proposes that this manifesto be spread far and wide. There wouldn't be any danger in doing this from the Ixians or the fish dancers because the Tilaxu already installed face dancers that sat in the highest councils of both, and this change had gone undetected. The guild wouldn't move against them because the Tilaxu are their only source of melange. As for the honored matres, more on them later. The Talaxu already think that the rivalry between the Onnit Matres and the Bene Gesserit will help rid them of the Bene Gesserit. The Onnit Matres are the big bads of Heretics of Dune. They're basically a matriarchal cult with powers similar to their Bene Gesserit, but the Onnit Matres have also perfected the pleasures of sex far beyond that of any others. As for the Atreides Manifesto, because all religions except that of the Talaxu are called into question in the manifesto, they're wary of being accused of authoring it themselves. 11-year-old Shiana is in her third year with the priests of Rakus, previously known as Arrakis, and she's in her still suit in the dunes observing a worm. Shiana did not think of the approaching monster as Shai Hulut, god of the sands, a thing the priests chanted each morning in obeisance to the pearl of Leto II's awareness that lay encapsulated in each of the multi-rigid rulers of the desert. She thought of the worms mainly as they who spared me or as Shaitan. They belong to her now. It was a relationship begun slightly more than three years ago during the month of her eighth birthday. Like the other children in her village, Shayana was searching the desert for scraps of spice left behind by the worms and remnants of the old Fremen Siech strongholds. The rock barriers served as some security against the worms. Suddenly, she heard screams and was just in time to see a wild worm penetrating a hole in the barrier in the far side of her village. The gigantic flame-shadowed mouth scooped up people and hovels in a swiftly tightening circle. Shayana saw the last survivors huddled at the center of the destruction. Even even as she watched, some of the people tried to break away into the desert. Shayana recognized her father among the frantic runners. None escaped. The great mouth engulfed all before turning to level the rest of the village. Smoking sand remained and nothing else of the puny village that had dared to claim a scrap of Shaitan's domain. The place where the village had been was as unmarked by human habitation as it had been before anyone walked there. Not a single human remained in view. In her anger, Shayana went after the worm, beating it with her fists, also filled with terror at the prospect of the worm rolling over and crushing her. But it didn't do that. She then rode the worm. Then a thopter with priests landed nearby, and Shiana was aware that she would be in trouble with them because riding the worms was now seen as demeaning the scattered bits of Leto II. She went back with the priests, who decided to test her because it seemed to them as though the worms obeyed her commands. They take her out to the desert and the worms come, but they don't attack her. They obey her commands to retreat as she wishes them to go away. Waf meets with an honored matre and among other things, she asks him why the Talaxu continue to sell golas to the reverend mothers only to kill them. She correctly guesses, you have somehow changed this gola while still making it possible for him to regain his original memories, which makes Waf question whether there's a traitor among the reverend mothers or the Talaxu. Or could the honored matre somehow read his thoughts? Is this something of the scattering? She seems to have some reverend mother powers she also makes her demand then. You will take back as your guests two young honored matres. They are to be bred with you and teach you our ways of ecstasy. The two honored matres I send with you will make an inspection of everything to Laksu and return to me with their report. When she summons them in, Waf is pleased to notice that one of the honored matre is a Tilaxu face dancer 
undetected by the scattered ones. So the Tilaxu have successfully planted spies within the Honored Matres. He then kills the Honored Matre and the one who was not a face dancer with poison darts. Shayana is among the priests now and she senses fear in them. She can smell their pheromones. The priests are very subservient, complying with her demands. They believe that she can communicate with God now, so she becomes something of a holy child. We learn from Drummond, a historian, that the name Shayana is modern for the ancient name Named Siona. You all know Siona's place in the histories. She served Shai Hulut in his transformation from human shape into the divided god. Shiana will be moved to the high priest's quarters to be carefully studied. The high priest Tuek thinks that she has been sent by God to weed out evil in the ranks of the anointed. Inevitably, word of Shayana spreads throughout Rakus and off-planet. But not once did Shayana reveal her true origins, nor what Shaitan had done to her family and neighbors. That was a private thing between Shaitan and herself. She thought of her silence as payment for having been spared. Duncan is 15 years old and he's experiencing some kind of memories. Someone else is in my mind, he thought. Not just in his mind and his body. He could sense other experiences as though he had just awakened, knowing he had dreamed but unable to recall the dream. This dream stuff called up knowledge that he knew he could not possess, yet he did possess it. He could name some of the trees he smelled out there, but some of those names were not in the library's records. Lucilla and Shuangu are discussing Duncan and the possibility of them creating another Kwisatz Haderach, and the possibility of a Tilaxu betrayal is brought up. He is primitive genetic stock and not bred to be a Kwisatz Haderach, Lucilla said. But the Tilaxu have interfered with his genetic inheritance. Yes, at our orders. They have sped up his nerve and muscle responses. Is that all they have done? Shuangu asked. You've seen the studies, Lucilla said. If we could do as much as the Tilaxu, we would not need them, Shuangu said. We have our own Axeltal tanks. You think they have hidden something from us? Lucilla said. They had him completely outside our observations for nine months. If we get another Paul Atreides, or the gods forbid, another tyrant, it will be Taraza's doing. Shiana still takes visits to the desert to get answers from the worm about why it destroyed her village, but the worm refuses to answer. She also asks the worm other questions like what happens to people that the worm eats? Should she stay with the priests? Her spies know of this, but they want to know how the worm or god responds. The populace is also starting to see her as their priestess. On Gamu, it seems as though an attack on Duncan is imminent. Tarasa tells Teg that desperate attempts will be made to kill Duncan before his old memories can be fully awoken. Tarasa and Teg are assessing the situation with the Tilaxu. The Tilaxu had sold the Skola to the Sisterhood 12 times and the Sisterhood had paid in the hardest currency, melange, from their own precious stores. Why did the Tilaxu accept in payment something they produced so copiously? Remember, the Tilaxu can produce melange in their Axetal tanks. The answer is obvious, to deplete the Sisterhood's supplies. A special form of greed there. The Tilaxu were buying supremacy, a power game. Teg focused on the quietly waiting Mother Superior. The Tilaxu have been killing our golas to control our timing, he said. Teraza nodded but did not speak, so there was more. Later, Teraza orders Odrade to tell Teg about the Atreides Manifesto, since she, Ordrade, had seen it. This is the text of the Manifesto. Just as the universe is created by participation of consciousness, the prescient human carries that creative faculty to its ultimate extreme. This was the profoundly misunderstood power of the Atreides bastard, the power that he transmitted to his son, the tyrant. Basically, that God and all of his works were no more than human creations. Later, when Odrade and Teg talk, she reveals that she is one of his daughters. She also reveals herself as the author of the manifesto, which she wrote at Mother Superior Teraza's instruction. It was the Bene Gesserit's intention to have the Tilaxu spread it. On Rikus, Tuek, the high priest of the Divided God, is thinking about Leto II, and here we get some information on the priest's beliefs. The metamorphosis of Leto II had given birth to uncounted sand trout, each carrying a bit of himself. Sand trout to Divided God, the sequence was known and worshipped. 
to question this denied God. They basically believe that parts of Leto II are in the sand trout all throughout the desert and this is who or what they're now worshipping. Teresa makes a reference to heretics when she's talking to Teg about his mother. A wise woman but another heretic. That's all we seem to be breeding nowadays. Heretic? He was caught by resentment. That's a private joke in the sisterhood. We're supposed to follow a mother superior's orders with absolute devotion. And we do, except when we disagree. On Rakas, there's an attempted attack on Shayana, and the Bene Gesserit send a message to the Ixians and Tilaxu telling them that they will pay. They will give a punishment to the conspirators. Reverend Mother Audrade is going to train and teach Shayana to be a Reverend Mother. Things are tense at first as Shayana is bratty, for lack of a better word, Odrade is not obeying her orders the way the priests do. The priests, of course, are not happy about the Bene Gesserit meddling, more on that later. Back on Gamu, Duncan's training is going well and Lucilla knows what her next task is with him, the sexual imprint. She does have an attraction to Teg as well, and one of her tasks is to have his child. She tries to seduce him, but he tells her that his breeding days are over and he wishes to be left alone. One day during training, she realizes then that Teg isn't Teg, he's a face dancer. But soon, the real Teg takes the face dancer Teg down with a last gun. Waf and Teraza are in a tense standoff. He wants to know about the message that they sent to the Talaxu from Rakus. The message saying that they'll pay following the threat on Shayana's life. Teraza threatens to reveal to the honored Matres that the Talaxu have face dancers in their midst, which would not be good for the Talaxu. She tells him that even if they try to subvert any of the reverent mothers as they did with Shuangyu, they'll never learn anything of value. They'll never penetrate the ranks of the Bene Gesserit. Teraza wants him to tell her everything that they know about the Honored Matres in exchange for her silence. She confronts him about the Gola too then. You have been killing our Golas to control the movement of a project in which you have no part other than to provide a single element, Teraza accused. You have buried your own scheme in his psyche, Teraza said. I warn you, Sir Waff, that if your alteration obstructs our design, we will wound you deeper than you think possible. Teraza's reference to Shuangyu here is that there were some security breaches at the keep on Gamu and a threat to Duncan. Shuangyu was responsible for letting the attackers into the keep over a pact with the Tilaxu. She disobeyed Mother Superior's orders. Remember, she was violently opposed to the Gola project. After the attack on the keep, Teg, Lucilla and Duncan managed to escape to take Duncan to Rakus. As he worked his way ahead, Teg realizes that he's come to a decision about Lucilla. Her plans for Duncan must be deflected. Every Mentact projection Teg could make about Duncan's safety and sanity required this. The awakening of Duncan's pre-Gola memories must come ahead of any imprint by Lucilla. It would not be easy to block her, Teg knew. It required a better liar than he had ever been to dissemble for a reverent mother. It must be made to appear accidental, the normal outcome of circumstances. Lucilla must must never suspect opposition. Teg held few illusions about succeeding against an aroused reverend mother in close quarters. Better kill her. That he thought he could do. But the consequences. Teresa could never be made to see such a bloody act as obedience to her orders. No, he would have to bide his time, wait and watch and listen. On Rakus, Odrade and Tuek are discussing Shiana, and Odrade wants him to know that Shiana wishes to be a reverent mother, but Tuek thinks that the reverent mothers have ways of influencing people. What has all this to do with the holy child, Tuek demanded? You told me we must meet on matters concerning. Indeed, don't try to deny that you know there are many people who are beginning to worship Shiana. The manifesto implicates manifesto manifesto. It is a heretical document which will be obliterated. As for Shiana, she must be returned to our exclusive care, Tuek says. Odrade says no, so there is a bit of a battle for custody over Shiana. Tuek, by the way, thinks of the manifesto as a dangerous heresy, assaulting everything that they hold sacred. There is a meeting between Tuek, Odrade, and Waf, and Waf tries to kill both of them, but Odrade manages to break his arms, not before one of Waf's darts kills the priest Tuek, though. As the face dancers come in, Odrade holds Waf and threatens to kill him if they make a single move. She forces 
forces WAF into an alliance then, and WAF asks her what the Bene Gesserit get out of an alliance. Audrade says, our survival in the face of the storm that is brewing among the scattered ones. The Talaxu survival too. The furthest thing from our desire is to end those who preserve the great belief. A faced answer will for the time being take over to X identity. Teresa is looking over projections for the possible breeding plan for Raf. Offspring would surely be like all the previous ones the Bene Gesserit had attempted with the Talaxu. The females would be immune to memory probing. The males, of course would be impenetrable and repellent chaos. Teraza also doesn't know where Teg, Duncan and Lucilla are. She revises the plan for Adrade as well, to take Waf out into the desert to test and see if the Talaxu are using the Gola for their own immortality. She has faith in Odrade, but a lot rides on Shayana. Duncan, meanwhile, is anxious to get his memories restored, but Teg tells him that he needs to be prepared first because Duncan might be resentful and angry at being brought back to life again. Remember, this was a big theme in God Emperor of Dune. Eventually, Duncan's memories are awakened by Teg and he remembers what his instructors had said. He will have Gola imposed filters on his pre-Gola memories memories. Some of the original memories will come flooding back. Other recollections will return more slowly. There will be no meshing though until he recalls that original moment of death, which Duncan does shortly thereafter. They killed me, Duncan said. It was a flatly unemotional statement all the more chilling for its positive delivery. A violent shudder passed through him and the trembling subsided. At least a dozen of them in that little room. He looked directly at Teg. One of them got at me like a meat cleaver right down on my head. He hesitated, his throat working convulsively. His gaze remained on Teg. Did I buy Paul enough time to escape? Teg tells him that Paul escaped from the Sardaukar. He later discovers that the Tilaxu have done something to him, but he doesn't know what. This all takes place in the old Harkonnen no globe stronghold where he, Teg, and Lucilla are. On Rakus, Shiana, Odrade, and Waf are in the desert and they see how Shiana is able to control the worm to command it. They eventually ride the worm and end up in Siech Tabar, and Odrade finds a store of melange hidden, left there for her, from Leto the Second for her to find. She also finds some writing from Leto the Second on the wall written above the melange. A reverent mother will read my words. I bequeath to you my fear and loneliness. To you I give the certainty that body and soul of the Bene Gesserit will meet the same fate as all other bodies and all other souls. What is survival if you do not survive whole? Ask the Bene Telax that. What if you no longer hear the music of life? Memories are not enough unless they call you to noble purpose. Why did your sisterhood not build the golden path? You knew the necessity. Your failure condemned me, the God Emperor, to millennia of personal despair. My words are your past. My questions are simple. With whom do you ally? With the self-idolators of the Talax? With my fish speaker bureaucracy? With the Cosmos Wandering Guild? With Harkonnen blood sacrifices? With a dogmatic sink of your own creation? How will you meet your end? As no more than a secret society? Odrade also reveals to Worf that she wrote the Atreides Manifesto and she says that the title is still true because she is a descendant of the Atreides. Three months go by and Teraza hasn't heard from Teg. She wonders whether the Tilaxu have him or attackers from the scattering. Ships from the scattering flitted through Teraza's fatigue-fogged imagination. Lost ones returned in their uncounted no-ships. Was that where Teg found a ship? The Tilaxu had been dealing with people returned from the scattering. With these Horish honored matres and the returned Bene Telax as well, Teraza sensed a single design behind events. The Lost Ones did not return out of the simple curiosity about their roots. The gregarious desire to reunite all humankind was not enough in itself to bring them back. The honored matres clearly came with dreams of conquest. Lucilla wants to carry out her task of sexually imprinting on Duncan, but he doesn't care for it or her touches. He tells her that he doesn't want to be a stud for the witches, and if she keeps trying, he will try to kill her. She then tells him about Shiana. The worms of Rakus obey her. Somehow the sisterhood must gather this talent. Somehow the sisterhood must gather this talent into its own store of abilities. They one day leave the No Globe and are attacked by face dancers. Teg stays behind and gives Duncan and Lucilla a chance to escape, but eventually he's captured and tortured. The pain of the torture that he has to endure ends up opening some new human potential in him, which he refers refers to as his second vision. Things flickered in his second vision. Knowledge of things around him before those things occurred 
awareness of where he must put his foot in the next step. Behind this lay the reactive trigger that he knew could snap him into the blurring responses that flesh could not be able to accommodate. Reason could not explain the thing. He felt that he walked precariously along the cutting edge of a knife. So this second vision is kind of like a power of prescience where he can anticipate things before they happened, whether it's danger or violence, and then he can move accordingly, but at something that seems like non-human speed. Duncan has sex with Mubella and Honored Matre, and while this happens, he starts to remember all of his deaths and even the Axetal tanks. He finds that what the Tilaxu had hidden in him was that he should kill the Imprinter, so it's meant to be Lucilla, the Bene Gesserit, but right now he's with the Honored Matre, so he doesn't kill her. Mubella realizes that he's a Gola armed with Tilaxu knowledge, and he can do things only permitted to on at Matres, and so he needs to be killed. She's about to kill him, but she ultimately fails. Teg kills everyone with his new double vision power and makes it to Rakus with trusted officers from Gamu, and he tells them that they're there to pick up Shayana, Odrade, Duncan, and a worm. He tells Lucilla, who is also there, that the honored Matres have killed Teraza, so Odrade will be the new Reverend Mother Superior. As the rest escape to the planet Chapter House, Teg and his men will stay behind on Rakus to cause a diversion with the Honored Matres, who will destroy Rakus, and Teg knows that nothing will remain. Basically, the one worm that they took with them to Chapter House will be placed in melange water and result in a new sand trout. They'll also have to transform the planet Chapter House into the desert. So in any case, Teg ends up sacrificing himself. At the end, Duncan tells Odrade that he won't have a child with Shiana, who he describes as that twit from Rakis. Odrade says that it's fine because they still have the child of Murbella. Odrade even says that Shiana could become a sister, but she is aware that Shiana might go along with a plan long enough to learn their secrets so that she could one day escape. As for Duncan, Odrade tells him that she will help him any way she can to lead the life he wishes because her ancestors and her father loved him. And that is the end of Heretics of Dune. Feel free to share your thoughts and thank you for watching.